Hello. Ah, hi, Bob. Hi, Jim. Good. I'm glad you're there. That's great. Okay. <laughs> right. Uh, so I hope you'll agree, everybody, that we've left the best till last. And it's been a great day. And I'd like to thank Petros especially for, um, you know, dispelling some of the glue, current gloom by bringing us all together in this way. Um, but as I say, it's my great pleasure to be able to introduce Robert Oosterhout, um, who is the Professor Emeritus in the History of Art at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he's the author of numbers of books on monographs and other works on Byzantine art history and architecture. Um, I mean, I think possibly one of the most significant was published in 1999, The Master Builders of Byzantium, which was then republished in paperback, a new edition in 2007. And in some ways, that's the, that's the starting point for the, the book we're celebrating today. But since then, he's also, his other most recent works are visualizing community, art, material, culture, and settlement in Byzantine Cappadocia, uh, published, uh, also published now in a Turkish translation, um, and important new uh, collected works on Piroska and the Pantocrator, and most especially what we're all waiting to look at. I mean, I don't know who may, how many people have actually seen the real book, um, which is the work of the, on the Holy Apostles, a lost monument, a forgotten project, and the presentness of the past, which he edited with Margaret Mullet. Um, field work over many years has concentrated on architecture, monumental art, urbanism, um, not just urbanism, because in Cappadocia he's gone beyond that into the into the, to the landscape of of the Byzantine world, um, in areas as diverse as Constantinople, Thrace, Cappadocia, and Jerusalem, and in Cappadocia in particular, his uh, his summer school, which he's coordinated with Koch University, Cappadocia in context, has been a sort of great training ground for uh, great teams of. Byzantine art historians and archaeologists. To cap it all this year and to demonstrate uh, the, the, the great, uh, the appropriateness of the selection of this particular work, uh, he was awarded uh, the, uh, by my notes, he was awarded the Harkness Medal by the Medieval Academy of America. It is, I checked, their most prestigious award. And just just the final sentence, a work of mature scholarship, this comprehensive study in both an essential foundation for future uh, and for future work on early medieval architecture and an important point of reference for scholars working in another architectural tradition. It's a very comprehensive work. It's much broader than its predecessors like uh, Krautheimer's work on Byzantine architecture or Cyril Mango's. Um, it's a work which is filled with Bob's typical wit. There's one chapter, because he, he is broad in his span, uh, which is um, the exotic West. And that deals with Venice, Southern Italy uh, and Sicily. At that point, I shall hand over to Bob, to, as we say, interminably, share your screen. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Thank you for the kind remarks. This has been um, such a wonderful day, and I thank everyone involved uh, with it. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Um, here we go. Um, the rich and diverse medieval architectural traditions of the Eastern Mediterranean and adjacent regions are the uh, subject of my book. I hope it provides a useful reconsideration of a field of study many of us learned in the handbooks of Mango or Krautheimer, both written in the 1970s, uh, that is, before many of you were born. Now, my goal was to provide an updated assessment that is accessible to scholars at all levels, evocatively illustrated and affordable. On that last point, trust me, it's a bargain, particularly discounted at 29 pounds. Think of it, hardback, 800 pages, all color illustrations, everything you need to know, and more. Well, the focus, of course, is the Byzantine Empire, 
although the framework expands chronologically to include the foundations of Christian architecture and the legacy of Byzantine culture after the fall of Constantinople. Geographically broad as well, the study includes the architectural developments in Italy and the Caucasus, the Near East and the Balkans, Russia, as well as uh, related developments in early Islamic architecture. That is, areas connected culturally or politically with the Byzantine Empire. The title of the book, Eastern Medieval Architecture, is intended to reflect its breadth, covering more than just the Byzantine Empire and more than just the Eastern Mediterranean. This book might have been titled Architecture of the Forgotten Middle Ages, for it addresses the lesser known and understudied monuments of the East, which often stand in sharp contrast to their better known contemporaries in Western Europe. Why did medieval architecture in the East follow a different trajectory from that of the West? This is a critical question and one the book hopes, uh, attempts to answer. Several suggestions have been put forward, such as economic factors or notions of sacred presence, but the difference may lie more in worship practices. Although corporate worship never disappeared in Byzantium, private devotion grew in popularity, more conveniently housed in smaller buildings. Even the nature of monasticism differed. Rather than the grand establishments of Western Europe with a regularized typology, a fixed rule, and large populations, Byzantine monasteries uh, tended to be small family-sized units, less formally organized, and without an established architectural typology. Moreover, from the uh, 12th century onward in Western Europe, the cathedral dominates the architectural scene, representing a concept of urbanism all but unknown in the East, where buildings continued to be the product of individual patronage rather than communal effort. From a comparative perspective then, the differences between East and West are as instructive as the similarities. Well, the standard approach to Byzantine architecture begins with basic typology and taxonomy of buildings. And although a variety of texts survive, buildings often constitute our primary surviving evidence for reconstructing or reimagining the culture that produced them. So we're uh, obliged to learn all we can about them, beginning with their physical structure closely observed. That is, to read the fabric of the building with the same insight and nuance a philologist would apply to the study of a text. If we are to understand what a building means, um, how it communicates, we must begin with its grammar, vocabulary, and syntax. The approach adopted in this book begins with formal analysis as a first step toward understanding the cultural context. How does a building reflect the con concerns of the society that produced it, symbolically or ideologically? How does it reflect the social, economic, or economic situation of its day? How was, how was it used on a daily basis? Now, these questions may move us into the world of the social historian, whose concerns are often at odds with the approaches, standard approaches to Byzantine art and architecture. Traditional art history, for example, relies on stylistic or iconographic analysis and has only in the last decades become concerned with issues of patronage, context, and social history. Because the vast majority of the surviving architecture is religious, it's also often read in religious terms only, rather than as windows on to the society that produced it. Historians of material culture, on the other hand, um, often, uh, tend to shy away from high art or architecture that reek of elitism or religiosity. Um, and yet, the churches are hard to ignore as they stand in sharp contrast to the paltry remains of urban and residential architecture, which were less carefully constructed and often built of ephemeral materials. That is to say, the religious buildings represent the concerns that were most important to the society that built them. They have survived for a reason. And writing about architectural history depends on surviving buildings, of course, with the majority of them ecclesiastical structure, medieval architecture, both East and West, is often dismissed as all about churches. As I argue, a church is never just a church. It may stand as a manifestation of piety or the spiritual aspirations of its age. We would be remiss not to recognize it as such. 
but it's also a social construct, an emblem of power, prestige, and identity. It represents the combined efforts of artisans of varying backgrounds and social status. It is the product of intention, a social contract orchestrated within a hierarchy of command, technical knowledge, and labor. At all levels, Eastern medieval people responded to their architectural environment, for buildings were the visual manifestations of human enterprise in the world around them. Although we are much better informed about religious architecture, the last decades have seen increased interest in secular architecture, with archaeological studies bringing a range of forms and new building types into discussion. Urban entities, fortifications, palaces, houses, public buildings, baths, and water supply systems. The state of research varies for these topics. Uh, these topics is none as well as well preserved as the churches. While archaeology has dramatically expanded our knowledge of aspects of daily life, urbanism, or military technology, there is a concomitant danger of Eastern medieval architecture becoming a subset of archaeology or of social history. To use the terminology of Vitruvius, utilitas or function becomes our main concern with firmitas or structure, uh, a distant second, and venustas or aesthetics, not at all. As the texts often emphasize, a Byzantine viewer understood a great building as a work of art and responded to it accordingly. At the same time, new areas of investigation have considerably broadened the field of study, and they allow a discourse on architecture that addresses all levels of society. In short, a more integrated approach is necessary if we're going to understand historical architecture in its many contexts. So to this end, the building includes chapters with differing approaches, both those that discuss architectural developments by period or region, and thematic essays on topics ranging from urbanism to ceremonies to construction technology. Finally, an examination of its architecture emphasizes that the Eastern medieval world was neither static nor isolated. It was both fluid and dynamic, regularly invigorated by the movement of peoples and ideas. Areas of cultural interchange are particularly instructive in this respect as planning types, structural solutions, and architectural details were disseminated across great distances. The architecture of the Crusades or of Norman Sicily, for example, make no sense at all without the, uh, an understanding of both regional and international architectural traditions. There's also an element of time to consider. In architectural studies, there's, um, uh, we tend to focus on the moment of inception. Uh, but most, bu most buildings have long histories replete with additions, modifications, changes in function or changes in demographics. Buildings are forever in the process of becoming and to isolate them at a single moment in their rich histories limits what we might learn from them. In some buildings have lives of their own and taken together, Eastern medieval architecture has a fascinating story to tell. <laughs>